the title of this talk is uh, Making WebGL Dance, and that's because linear algebra isn't as sexy on a schedule. Uh, but the talk isn't so much about WebGL directly as it is about graphics hardware and how it works. Because this could be making OpenGL dance or Direct 3D, all these principles uh, kind of apply. And so my remote is not working. Just a sec. There we go. Uh, so I'd like to talk about three things how to draw, where to draw, and what to draw, which is sort of the, the mental model of how you should think about what a graphics card does and where it comes from, uh, as opposed to doing sort of yet another uh, WebGL 101, how to draw a cube and make it move. Because while that teaches you, you know, how to use WebGL and how to use the API, it kind of uh, ends up being a dead end because you're not quite sure what's going on. And uh, once you get into more advanced stuff, if there's a bug or an issue, uh, you don't know what to do. Uh, so the good news is, however, everything I'm going to be talking about is really stuff that you should understand but not necessarily know how to implement yourself because the graphics hardware does it for you. It's convenient. So even though there's going to be a lot of um, techniques and all that, uh, don't be worried about it because you just you know, type the command or set the thing to true to, to get that effect going. The bad news is there's going to be four dimensions. Uh, <laughs> And I'm not going to apologize about that, because it's cool. Uh, and uh, the thing is, you know, this is mathematics, but we shouldn't be afraid of it. We should embrace it. Uh, what this means in this case is there's just a fourth number where before there used to be only three, and it has some interesting consequences. So let's get started. Uh, in the beginning, uh, there was pixels. And uh, pixels were fun, but no, that's not true. There was vector graphics first, but we'll forget about that. Pixels. There was something called Bresenham lines, and that was fun because using a simple for loop, you could just color in pixels and, and draw lines. Uh, and once we figured out how to do that, we could even draw solid shapes using something like scan line rendering to draw a triangle like this. Uh, unfortunately, if you try to, for example, make a spinning triangle with this technique, it doesn't so much rotate as tick. Why does it tick? Why does it look bad? Well, it's because we're snapping to pixels. Everything we've done is we've defined our graphics operations in terms of the pixel grid, which means we can only move the corners uh, in, in this fashion. How, how do we solve this? Uh, well, if you know a little bit about graphics, you may be thinking of the word anti-aliasing. No, that's something else. Because look at this beautifully anti-aliased triangle that's still jerking around uh, in an ugly fashion. What we actually want is something called subpixel accuracy, which looks like this. Where even though you know, it's alias, there's only black and white and there's jaggies, it's moving smoothly and I can put the corners of the shape anywhere I want. How exactly does this work? Because it, it's not obvious anymore where exactly the, the edges on the pixel grid start or end, when the, the pixel in the corner actually should be black when it's partially covered, etc. And the key is something called sampling or using samples. Where whether a pixel is black or white is actually just defined by one thing, which is the point right in the middle. So if that point is inside the triangle, we color the, uh, the pixel black. Otherwise, we color it white. And this might not seem like an important concept, but it really is because it defines everything that follows. And that's kind of why I'm talking about it first. Because what this means is there's really two worlds. On the left hand, you have the world of vectors, uh, where you know, everything is mathematical and beautiful. Your, your shapes are mathematically defined, uh, and then you Use sampling to transfer it over to the world on the right, which is the raster world, the world of pixels. Uh, and you really have to think of this sort of as a final step. And uh, the reason is because when you actually look at this diagram, on the left-hand side, those samples are, are in the middle of every pixel. And that means the edges of the pixel grid don't actually exist in vector world. They're sort of an artifact of, of the rasterization, if you will. Uh, and in fact, we describe this as a nearest neighbor filter where you know, the, when we try to turn this grid of samples back into something continuous, we just assign the color of the nearest sample to that area. And the fact that the pixels come out square is kind of just an artifact of, uh, that is not good, um, of, uh, the, of where the samples are placed. And, and so this is ugly and pixelated. Uh, a better way is, for example, to use a, a bilinear filter, where you, you add gradients between pixels to sort of uh, even it out. And what's important about this diagram is that the color information is not, again, on the, on the edges of the pixel grid. It's in the middle. Uh, and, and so the, the edges of the pixel are, are kind of uh, a distraction. They, they don't factor in here. Uh, 
so what actually is anti-aliasing and aliasing for? Well, it's this. Uh, in this case, I'm taking a texture of white and of uh, gray and black and uh, looking at it in perspective, and it's being sampled. And you can see in the distance, there's all this uh, noise and, and blurriness going on. Uh, and the reason that happens is because when you sample, you can only pick one or the other, either gray or black. What it actually should look like is something like this, where the further you go into the distance, the, the more blurred out in gray it gets, uh, because you know the projection of a single pixel on the screen now covers a, a wide area far, far, far in the distance. Uh, lo looking at aliasing a bit closer has to do with something called the sampling theorem and the Nyquist frequency, where if you take this pattern of bars and you compress it, you get to this, this point where it goes white, black, white, black, white, black, uh, alternating. And you try to compress it further, it starts to get messed up. In fact, it, it folds in on itself and does something weird. Uh, running that backwards, you can see you approach the Nyquist frequency, white, black, white, white, black, white, black, and then it expands smoothly again. So what that means is you can't compress any more variation onto the, the pixel grid than that particular uh, frequency because there's no room for it. And so the fact that you get jaggies when you're trying to draw shapes uh, is really an artifact of aliasing. And instead of thinking again of the pixel edges, you need to look at the slopes here. Because, because of the pixel grid, there's a maximum slope between white and black that we can, we can represent with this information. Uh, and that's really where the problem lies. It has very little to do with jaggies, uh, which is what most people think of when they talk about anti-aliasing. So what is anti-aliasing? Uh, is it blurring all the things? Sort of. It's blurring it in a specific way. What you're actually doing is you're determining how much of your shape uh, covers every pixel and then shading the, the pixel proportionately. And so you can do that uh, mathematically using the rules of geometry to get an exact result. Uh, but that's kind of annoying, especially when you have, you know, not one triangle, but let's say a million, which is not all that uncommon these days. Uh, so we use something else called super sampling, where you put lots of samples inside the pixels, and then uh, you get, you know, in this case, 16 shades of gray possible per pixel, and that sort of looks okay. Unfortunately, now you're doing 16 times more work, so they invented something called multi-sampling, uh, where you only apply the, the, the dense sampling on the pixels that need it, and it looks like this. Uh, now, now you'll, you'll notice in the middle of the shape, you know, we're doing traditional sampling, which means there's no anti-aliasing there, which means it is going to look ugly and then distorted like before. So for that, we use uh, other things like the, the anisotropic filtering that I showed before. And the, what you end up approximating in sampling is something more like this, uh, where this looks more like a spinning triangle uh, than the, the jagged one before, which just skipped around. Now, if you try to think of this in the, the pure vector world without sampling, this is going to look something like this, which is a, a triangle that's rotating smoothly, surrounded by a one pixel wide gradient. And you can see that because of the sampling, this is where the sort of shades of gray stair steps comes from, as this gradient transitions underneath the, the sampling grid. And whenever you have any sort of filtering technique, whether it's a Gaussian blur or MIP mapping or an anisotropic filter, you're basically just blurring your information before sampling it to make sure that the slope of your uh, color information does not exceed the limit that you can uh, represent. Now, just for uh, completeness, I mentioned this, WebKit font smoothing, which is, you know, a lot of people have issues with this and, and turn it off. Uh, because Apple kind of did something stupid and uses a different filter that makes the font look darker. Uh, but it's just, you know, it's sampling on a sub-pixel grid doing red, green, blue separately. Uh, and the thing is, pixels are really dying or, or are dead, but they've been reborn. Because pixels are dead as a design unit uh, because everything is scalable now. And, and even though I'm supposed to, be, supposed to be talking about WebGL, all of this also really applies to CSS now uh, because your iPhone, uh, your, your zoomable browser is a, a GL scene and, and is defined in vector world, not in raster world. And, and not just pixels, uh, but any sort of information in geometry, for example, this height map, which I'm generating uh, procedurally, and that's, that's a different talk, uh, is, is defined on a grid. And uh, you, know, you, you have to think of this as, as sampled information that you're processing. <clears throat> 
Now you can see here I'm tuning the knobs on this generator to, to make it oscillate in an interesting way. And you can see that I've added water. And you may be wondering, how does it know which part should be blue and which parts should be green? Is it, for example, taking the surface that I've defined and, and cutting out the parts that are underwater? Is it doing something else? Uh, well, it's actually quite simple. And it turns out that samples are both the curse and the, and the blessing, the problem and the solution. Because we use something uh, like your sample isn't just color. It can have additional information associated with it. For example, depth. We use something called a Z buffer, where for every pixel in your image, you just record the depth as a number, in this case represented as a shade of gray. And uh, whenever you draw anything, you update your depth map along with it so that you know, is the thing that I'm drawing closer or further away than what's already there? And so you can do per pixel cutting out of, of shapes that intersect without actually knowing uh, anything about the geometry involved. It's, it's a sort of very dumb but very effective way of doing it. And that turns out to be what GPUs are great at, because this is massively parallelizable. And aside from depth, for example, you, you might also record orientation in the form of a normal, which is a vector. I'll go into that more later. For example, for something called deferred lighting, where you, you generate an image like this, and then you paint the light in afterwards using only this information. So you, you stop knowing what is outside the frame of the picture. You, you don't even know what it represents. All you know is that you have a grid of samples with depth and normal and color that you then use to, to do lighting with. So the next step is the part where you learn linear algebra. And that might you know, send uh, heart rates spiking a little bit. But don't worry, because <laughs> we're going to do fun stuff with images. Uh, let's start with something called the affine transforms, which you would know as the transform tool from Photoshop or Illustrator. Uh, and those transforms include uh, rotation, scaling, and skewing. And they have something in common. What they have in common is that they all preserve parallel lines, no matter how you combine them. Uh, and, and that's a very useful property, because it means you can describe the entire transform just by saying what it does to the grid. Uh, so you, have, uh, you can describe the grid using something called a vector basis, which is just your x unit and y unit, represented as uh, an arrow in this case. And uh, because vectors are arrows, we, we can sort of do math with them. Uh, and that's, that's essentially linear algebra. But let's forget about the numbers for a second and just do it on paper. Uh, and suppose, for example, that I, I define a new vector basis. Uh, and I, I give you two arbitrary arrows. And I say, tell me what the smiley face looks like after it's been transformed. Or let's start with just that one point in purple, see what it looks like or, or where, where it should be. And that's easy, because you decompose it into its x and y coordinates, and then you uh, reassemble it on the other side using the new grid. And uh, because vectors are arrows, you can also scale them, not just add them together. Uh, and that means that using this procedure of disassembling and reassembling, you can find out where any point is uh, after it's been transformed just by uh, using your vector basis. And if you get this, then congratulations, you get matrices. Because these mysterious grids of numbers that they threw at you in school and that they never really bothered to explain are really simple. They're the coordinates of, of the blue and the green dot that just describe where the grid has moved to when you're done uh, transforming. And so the column on the left is just the x coordinate, y coordinate of the blue point. The, right, uh, the green numbers are the x and y coordinate of the green point. The reason you put them in a matrix is because that allows you to do the computations effectively, in this case, something called the matrix vector multiplication, which is just transforming a point to conform to a new grid. And it, it looks like this when you write it out. Uh, and so th again, you do this procedure of disassembling, in this case, literally cleaving your matrix into two and multiplying it by the, the two coordinates of the point that you're interested in. In this case, transforming the red point into the purple point, uh, transforming a circle into an oval. And then if we want to, for example, apply another transformation, let's say a rotation, we find that our vector basis has just moved to a new location, which means there's just a new matrix. Um, and this is where, where matrix math gets really interesting. Because if you do the naive solution to this problem, you apply two transforms, as in the bottom. And 
you know, for every transformation that you pile on, you have to do another matrix multiplication. But because of the properties, you can condense them all together and uh, end up just optimizing it away into a single transform. And that's sort of the secret as to why computer graphics can be fast, uh, because you can condense the relationship and the placement of objects into just a single uh, mathematical object of a constant size, namely a matrix. And this works in 2D, but it also works in 3D. So a 3D matrix is just a set of three vectors, in this case, uh, red, green, blue, that define an orientation in space. And uh, in the matrix, you end up with three columns of three coordinates. And uh, you, again, you do a, a matrix multiplication to transform, in this case, the flat smiley face into one that's positioned in uh, 3D. And it also works in four dimensions. And that can be a little weird. Now, why on earth would you do this? What's the point? Is, what is the fourth dimension? Uh, well, the, the key is actually in, in the image, which is four dimensions projected back into 3D, where suddenly parallel lines are no longer parallel, which is interesting because that's what perspective does. And when you're rendering in 3D, often you want perspective, you want it to look natural, and that is uh, why we use four dimensions. And I can't really show you four-dimensional math because picturing that is kind of kooky. But I'll show you how it works for two-dimensional images where you apply the third dimension to do the same kind of trick. So the, 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 the reason we use four-dimensional matrices to do 3D math is the same reason we use three-dimensional matrices to do 2D math. And it works like this. You have ordinary two-dimensional space, a grid, and uh, you end up sort of doing a bat signal thing where you project it outward like this. And uh, you apply, so, so this, is, this is space, this is 3D, and yet we call it two-dimensional space. Why? Well, because the image that we're projecting is two-dimensional, and just like you know, a bat signal projected onto a cloud, the, the light along any particular ray is constant, which means you only have two degrees of freedom instead of three. Why do we do this? Uh, well, because what happens when you start changing the vector basis? And uh, in doing so, we've gained a couple new things. For one, we've gained a whole new Z vector, the red one, uh, which, which didn't exist before. We just made that up. And that's the interesting one, because if you move that one, you aim the bat signal, just like that. And that means that all of a sudden, instead of just being able to change shapes in place, we can move them around as well, which is something that affine transforms couldn't do on their own. So you get translation and scaling effects where if you pull out the, the red vector or, or push it in, sort of changing its length, you end up tightening the beam or expanding uh, the beam. And uh, we, we have something else, which is that our x and y vectors now also have a z coordinate, which until now has just been zero. And they control the alignment of the, the image. Because if I uh, change those, for example, tilting them all the way back, you see that you tilt the image so that part of it is now closer to the projection point, part of it is further away, which ends up being what perspective does. So if you project this back down to two dimensions, now your parallel lines are no longer parallel and you, you've done perspective transforms. And then that has an interesting implication because it means that if I'm drawing something like this, a cube in 3D space, I can position and move and orient it using a single four-dimensional four matrix. And uh, the, it has a structure where in the upper left portion there's a three by three normal matrix that, can that controls rotation, scaling, skewing. Um, there's one for translation, which is you know, shining the, the beam differently in four-dimensional space. And then there's uh, the Z, the, sorry, in this case, the W coordinates, uh, the fourth coordinate, DHL, which um, controls perspective and creates uh, you know, narrowing lines effects and vanishing points and that sort of thing. And uh, like I said, matrices can be condensed. You know, applying five matrices in a row, you can express that as just one single combined matrix, which is very handy. And that means that the mathematical relationship between that little black cube on the screen and you know, as, as it's defined in, in 3D space, and the actual location on the screen as it's projected is defined by a single matrix. And, and I can show you how that works. We start in object space, which 
is what you're looking at, the cube on its own defined with the, its, the, the, the origin sort of at its center of mass, or if it's a character, usually you put it under their feet. Uh, but it's just somewhere in the middle, so you have a point of reference. You transform object space into world space by placing objects it with the matrix. matrix. You can scale them, rotate them, move them around, etc. And world space is where everything else lives. So in this case, I added a camera, and I added a ground plane so that it has something to sit on. And world space is, again, defined relative to some reference point, uh, which is the, the, the frame that you're doing all your, your placement and simulation in. Then we have another matrix transformation that takes you to view space, which is a coordinate system centered on your camera. Uh, in this case, Z points forward, uh, but that's a convention, and you have to be careful which way your axes point when you're doing these things. Uh, and finally, from view space, we go into screen space, which is simply uh, pixels and uh, pixel units. And so uh, because we're doing matrix transformations, this entire chain it ends up being implemented uh, or represented as a single transformation. And uh, you can go backwards as well, but that's a little bit trickier. Uh, finally, I just want to talk about shaders, which is how these things are actually implemented on, on a graphics card. Say, for example, you have a 3D model, which in this case is defined as vertices, points in space, and triangles that span those points. So in, in terms of data structure, you're looking at a list of vectors which define points, and then a set of indices saying, you know, triangle one goes from one to two to three, triangle two goes from two to three to four, et cetera, and that makes up this whole uh, object in object space. And then we have a program called a vertex shader that just takes one vertex as an input and outputs another vertex uh, as output. And you can see that it's th those are four-dimensional vectors that are coming out. And that, that's because we're dealing with the four-dimensional, sorry, 3D projective space, which has four coordinates. Um, and so this transforms into something called clip space, which I mentioned for completeness. You can just think of this as screen space. There's, there's a sort of a difference, but it's not very interesting. Uh, and then the second part is we take these coordinates into clip space, which is, you know, where is the thing on the screen? And then we turn it into samples. And then every one of those samples, we apply another program to, which is the fragment shader. Uh, and that determines the color of every pixel. So on, on the left, you see that the light is changing. The position of, of the vertices isn't changing. So um, only the parameters of the fragment shader are being tuned here, not the vertex shader. The vertex shader is just constant at this point. Uh, so what does this look like? This is defined in a language called GLSL, GL shading language. And uh, it's a very simple program. You can see that the main function consists of one line in this case, uh, which simply applies three separate matrices to the position after taking the, the position and making it four dimensional. Uh, and there's this is a complicated terminology here, but it, it's really not that hard. For example, uniforms are just global variables. For example, if you're trying to draw an object and the object is red, that, the fact that it's red is constant everywhere, so that's a uniform property. Uh, that you, you set. And then per vertex, we have something called attributes, which is the specific position of every point. And uh, the, at, the, at the end, we set GL position, which is a standard variable to, uh, that, that determines where on the screen you're rendering. And so this is, this is like your vanilla G, GL pipeline. But the point is that this is just one possible way of doing it. You can do tons of things in vertex shaders. Uh, and, and that's why shaders have been sort of the, the main driving force behind uh, what, what's been going on in games and in uh, just offline 3D rendering as well. Uh, transforming shapes on the fly on a sort of point by point basis is a very powerful approach because you can do it in parallel very efficiently. And then a fragment shader looks like this, for example. Again, we have uniforms, like say a color and a, a direction of light in this case. And then we have something called varyings. And then this, this can be a little bit tricky to grasp. But basically, our information at this point is only defined on the corners of the mesh. So when you're trying to fill the pixels in the middle, you need to have a way to transform that, that information. And you could just you know, assume that it's constant across the entire triangle, which makes it uniform. Or you could have a property that's varying, that varies, 
Uh, and the way that works is you just define it at the corners and the graphics hardware interpolates it for you, fills out the part in the middle. And then what this fragment shader does is determines how, how much of the surface should be lit by doing something called a vector dot product, which you can look up and see what that does, uh, and then multiplies that intensity by the color of the surface. Uh, and so this is, again, the, the simplest possible fragment shader. In fact, what's going on on the left is actually a little bit more complicated because it has something called specular light, which is sort of the, the glossiness uh, that I didn't even bother to implement in the code on the right. And uh, so here's an example of, for example, uh, a vertex shader that does some real work. This is skeletal animation. And the way you have to think about this is the model of, of in this case, the cyber demon from Doom 3 is just defined statically. And usually they even put it in a sort of Vitruvian man pose, so it's nice and neutral. And then they feed in the, the orientation of all the bones in the skeleton. Every point is linked to a, a, a point on the skeleton. And by tuning the knobs, by changing the matrices, uh, you can animate this character. And this is all done on the GPU, on the graphics hardware, not uh, on the CPU side. Uh, an example of a fragment shader that is, is very common is normal mapping. And so you see that all of a sudden, it seems like this model has become way more detailed. And, and that's an illusion, because the geometry hasn't changed. All I'm doing is I'm applying something called a normal map, which tells the, the which describes the orientation of the surface. And so I'm cheating, because it looks like it has tiny bumps and, and, and little crevices and all that, but it's, it's painted on, but in a way that changes the shading. So it's not just a texture, it's, it's information that is being splatted onto a model, interpolated and, and used to do the lighting on a per pixel basis. And uh, because this is such an, our eyes are easily tricked. We don't care about depth as much as we do about light and shadow. Uh, this is a very effective way of creating the appearance of hundreds of thousands of triangles when really there's only a couple thousand. Uh, and you combine that, for example, with a color map uh, texture and, and in, there's something else called the specular map which determines which part of this creature are glossy and which parts are metal or, or soft shaded. And you end up with something like this, which I think looks pretty damn cool. <laughs> and we're not done yet. I'll just show you one more trick uh, that you can do with fragment shaders. So here I've put a floor of bricks underneath the monster, and the bricks are being normal mapped. So that means that as, the, as I move the lights above it, you can see that the light sort of catches the edges of the brick, and then it looks like they have depth. But that's an illusion, because if, if I put the camera at a glancing angle, you can start to see that it's fake, that there's no actual depth here. It's just sort of a texture that happens to have convincing shading. Uh, but we can fix that. We, we apply something called parallax mapping. And suddenly, it looks like these bricks actually have depth. And yet, what I'm telling the GPU to do is still just draw a flat square. How does that work? Why, why does this all of a sudden look like it is correct? And here's the secret. I'm going to lock the, the uniform that tells the shader where the camera is. So the shader is going to think that the camera is staying right here when, when it's not. And I'm going to rotate to the other side. And now all of a sudden, this illusion is completely destroyed. And you can see, if you look closely, there's a sort of distortion going on with the texture, where this streakiness and, and, and weirdness. And so the point of this effect is it distorts the texture of the bricks in such a way that from your point of view, it looks correct in 3D. But it's really cheap. It's, it's completely fake. And so you can see that the, the, the silhouette at the top left, for example, stays a straight line. As far as the, the depth is concerned, this is a completely flat surface. Uh, but it's such an effective technique. And uh, here, for example, I'm going to update the, the uniform that, controls the, that tells it where the camera is. And all of a sudden, the illusion is restored, and you get breaks that look real. Uh, that's pretty much it. I just want to leave you with a couple of things to look at in case you like this and that's something you might want to do. Uh, Arrowtwist.com, which is Paul Lewis, uh, who has, it's not only a beautiful site, but the articles are, are really well written and simple and get straight to the point. So check those out. It, it's mostly 3.js, which is also what I use. Um, I like using 3.js because it just takes care of the boilerplate. Uh, there's Inigo Kiles' site. 
which is sort of like a treasure trove of demo scene techniques and, and other interesting mathematical things. Uh, Mr. Dube, who's the author of uh, 3.js, has a site full of demos and interesting things that you can look at. And uh, Alter Qualia is another person. Um, it was their implementation and port of the cyber demon model that I used for this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.